Today we're talking about racism. We're talking about environmentalism. We're having that conversation within the context of city planning, and we're having it with a city planner. After this conversation, I no longer look at the cities that I call home the same way. So much of the segregation that we live with and the environmental costs that we continue to pay are the result of bad community planning. Planning to house people in different parts of town because of their skin color or religious belief or what have you is bad. It was bad then, it's bad now. Planning a community in such a way that you have to have four cars for your family to get to where it needs to go because the community is sprawled out and there's no public transportation is bad planning because it contributes to climate change by forcing people to perpetuate unsustainable behaviors. So grab your coffee because we are going in today. Everybody, uh, welcome to Bottomless Coffee, supported by our fantastic community members on Patreon. Uh, I'm Jerome. Today, thank goodness, I am well caffeinated. Uh, it was like coffee in the afternoon and then like a matcha tea for this conversation. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Um, like I just mentioned, uh, this podcast is supported by community members. And generally, when we're talking about community, it's in uh, this kind of abstract, intellectual way. Um, but today we're going to get really literal um, and talk about the physical connections between us and um, not physical like um, Mariah Carey or Janet Jackson song. Uh, unfortunately, we're not that fun. It's uh, sidewalks, roads, rail, air transportation, um, all of that really good stuff that people don't sing about. Uh, but they rely on. We're talking about the planning behind the infrastructure that helps us get to where we're going. Um, and one reason why that's super important, at least in my opinion, is that where there is a connection, there is money, there is commerce. And frequently that infrastructure is funded by your tax dollars. So you are kind of deciding by way of your representation who gets to win and who gets to lose in the economy. Um, so that is about all I know on the topic. <laughs> but luckily, uh, our guest is an emerging expert in the area. I think that's fair to say. Uh, Ryan Colburn is with us. Hey, Ryan. Hi, Jerome. <laughs> yep, that's me. Emerging expert. I, <laughs> no, I didn't even say that. I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Expertise is one of those things that you have to claim for yourself. <laughs> so I believe in you. I think expert might be a strong word, um, but professional. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll go with that. So, yeah, I'm Ryan, Ryan Colburn. Uh, I am a transportation planner based in Houston, Texas right now. Okay. Um, if any of you guys know, it's notorious for its terrible traffic and giant highways. Oh, okay. Uh, I very much know like, when people say, oh, it's just across town. It's an hour drive. Um, it's been very interesting. It's a very interesting place to think about how we move and how our cities work. Um, yeah. Um, a little bit more, I guess, about me as like, I did undergraduate in political science and international relations, which is sort of what jumped me into the government world. Hmm. Um, and after that, I became due to like some experiences, uh, mostly a study, of, like, a study abroad experience, which I will touch on because it's very important. But like, I then branched into the professional world, went to grad school, went to Georgia Tech, hung out Woo. in Atlanta, other great city. Uh, think about transportation also super <laughs> well known for its insane traffic and its giant airport among other things yes um and ended up here and it's been really just a crazy smooth ride to get here but now i'm here uh mostly focusing on public transit and active mobility which for 
non-transportation people that means walking and biking being yeah. active so that's, that's what wonderful we thank you for that fantastic introduction to yourself because i'm here learning things about you that i didn't know before i feel as though um our primary interaction is maybe through instagram and so i see uh the instagram that i want you to plug is it tech transport tech transport yeah if you like cute pictures of trains and buses that's the place to be yeah. uh just documenting all the different ideas i started doing it it's so funny i started doing it a few years ago because people that actually do focus in transportation would block me on instagram because they would just what? see this you know i guess <laughs> random gay boy and like oh this must be spam he's just like you know one of those follow for follow bots or something and would block me and oh so wow I'm like, well, i don't want that to happen anymore so <laughs> i started this and it's been so much fun it's been so much fun so well they are really missing out because um, i know this is a major passion of yours that has now uh become a career um, what is it, what brought you to it? Were you sitting in traffic and you were like, okay, there's got to be a better way to do this or. <laughs> it actually isn't. Traffic was not involved at all. This is where I was like, it had to do with a, a combination of where I'm originally from and then a study abroad experience that I had. Oh, I hate okay. being cliche about that and saying study abroad changed my life, but it did. It does. I yeah. found so cliche, so whatever, but it was great. Anyway, so a lot of people uh, here, now that I'm in, you know, I'm in the eighth, I believe it's, it's up there. It's a top 10 largest city in the yes. country, Houston. And I'm me. Um, and then when I tell people, you know, I'm from a small farm in North Florida, people are like, then who are you to come out here and like oh. be planning our buses and all this? And, you know, like, you, this doesn't seem like you at all. Um, but so I grew up, you know, on a farm in Florida. We had chickens and turkeys. Wow. And okay. Pheasants and, uh, my grandpa had a huge cow farm. And so that really defined like my growing up experience. You know, hmm. everything was a million miles away. Family had four cars oh. to move us all around. Sure. Um, like, and then, like, so it was just really crazy. And then I studied abroad. Now I did, I studied abroad in France. But I did not study in Paris. I didn't study sure. in Munich. I didn't study in any of the big cities. I studied in a town of 800 people on a farm. Oh, on so a farm. I went okay. from one farm <laughs> to another farm. My host family loved me because I was an American. Like, I knew what to do. I was like, I know what to do. I know how to handle this. Yeah. Um, and it was great, but it was just such a life changing experience because, unlike at home, I had one car which they use to get to their barn. Okay. But other than that, the way everything was set up, here I was in this super rural environment, and I could walk to a grocery store. Mm. I could walk to um, a restaurant. I could walk to multiple restaurants. There's two in the town. Could walk to both. Huh. Um, <laughs> I could. There was bakeries. There were so many things just right there for me, even in this very rural environment. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to, I could bike or take a bus to the town next door multiple times a day where there were more things. I could catch a train and I could be on a high speed train to Paris in less than three hours for less than $20. Wow. So all wow. of a sudden here I am in the same situation that I lived in before. Yeah. But now I can get anywhere and everywhere and I don't even need a car. Now, I'm not going to be one of these people that out here is trying to convert everyone and get rid of your car, but the freedom to not have to have one, even in such a rural environment, mm -hmm. or to be, be so car light that we only needed one to get to the barn, like, and to do a few heavy things, was life altering. Sure. Let, let me, quick question, quick question. When you were living in Florida pre um, study abroad, did you feel any kind of way about how you were living at the time? Or were you like, this is normal, this is fine, I don't know anything else, and so... Uh, it, it was along those lines. I mean, I knew that other things were out there. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that rural life could be so much better. Gotcha. I was very much like, this is just how it is if I'm going to live in this kind of place, and I didn't think anything of it. 
Yeah. Um, but thinking about how we can make, granted, of course, now here I am in Houston, Texas, but like big giant city, but, but like still uh, thinking about rural mobility and uh, rural sustainability is really what sort of got me into this. And so as I like continued that and then learned a few things through school and then like I interned with the Senate, U.S. Senate, and my senator was on the transportation committee. So like connected the dots and now here I am. Now, hold on. I might have to revisit that emerging expert uh, phrase I was using before. I didn't know you had that, all these qualifications in that back pocket. Very uh, cool. <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's been a really fun journey. But like, yeah, that's sort of what it was. It was like, here I was on this tiny, rural, super poor town. Mm-hmm. And like, but yeah, and I could get everywhere quickly mm-hmm. and affordably. That was the other thing. Like, not only was it fast and I could actually get places, but then also I could afford to do it. So you weren't studying mobility and the like at that time. No. But you had this experience, which literally changed your life. And at some point, I guess, made you really interested. And it sounds like why things were so much more convenient and so different for you in France than at home. And it really, it like, it really inspired me going forward. I mean, that's what I've written in all my cover letters when I when I applied to grad school, when I when I applied to jobs. Like, it really, still to this day, like, and that particular region defines how I think about mobility and how we get around and how we can consider things. Um, truly life changing. Very very cool. So when you um, so you went to grad school, right? Mm-hmm. Having reference that experience. And when you were studying, uh, did you did you come across any insights as to as to why things are the way they are, particularly in rural America? <laughs> There's several things play together, I think, into that. Um, one thing is Americans, I feel like, at our heart and soul. If you look like go all the way back to when colonization was happening, sure, farming is part of our origin story yeah um and we really idealize everybody even if you don't farm per se let's just say not far let's even look at suburban people there's like this fantasy with owning land and all of this that's like embedded in american culture so that's one aspect of it um but then also i was like there's just like um we have such a weird relationship with rural america um on one hand, it's so like because of that, the government is willing to like pour so, so much money yeah. into rural and suburban areas. I was like, do you know, like out on the farm that I live, we had city plumbing still. Do you know how much it probably costs mm. to get a pipe out there or a power line and how much city like county taxpayers subsidized all of that for us <laughs> that's so interesting because i bet no one ever not i don't say no one but i bet a lot of people who are listening never really have thought about how much it costs to run that pipe or how much it costs to run those lines mm-hmm. now think about and that's to get to one house yeah that's the one thing i always tell people sort of about cities and stuff is like oh now imagine like you build an apartment there now it might be worth building that pipe there because there's a bunch of people there but we're doing that for just everybody Mm-hmm. And but then I was gonna say we actively encourage this too, like in the United States in particular, like um, to get out of the Great Depression. Like oh. we went in and we said, oh, we're gonna make home ownership easy in America, and we're gonna just give every not everyone, <laughs> we're gonna give white people a lot oh. of loans okay. to move out to the suburbs, uh, and fund the construction industry. Yeah. You know, uh, and so that's sure. where the suburbs originate is like there's a combination of a trying to get out of the city because if American cities were going through a really hard time, Great Depression times, mm-hmm. you know, it's like um, super bad poverty rates, uh, combating with racism Sorry, uh, right. in that regard. And so the government basically said, hey, well, we can kill two birds with one stone. We can get the country back on track. You know, uh. air- by funding the construction uh, industry. And then also like, they're also like unintended, you know, playing into people's, the white people's desire to get away and have their own little 
areas, which, you know, then get into redlining for oh. people that don't know what that is. Oh, like, go ahead. Know, tell it, tell it to I'll them. Let them know. <laughs> Just so that they know a little bit, like, you know, yeah. that you get into redlining and basically disallowing uh, certain groups of people in the United States. Principally, it was black people, but mm -hmm. also it was like gay people were banned from neighborhoods in certain places. Um, uh, Hispanic people, Asian people, some of the most famous court cases involved uh, discrimination against Asian people. Hmm. But yeah, I was like, that's that's how that all, it all plays together in this really fun, interesting world in that ultimately it's like, it's so ironic. <laughs> I was like, the unsustainability and the social aspects of the way American society is physically situated are very much related. So uh, certainly I agree with you. There, you're absolutely right. And um, you are certainly hitting on two major topics. I wouldn't even say hitting on, you are pointing directly at two major topics that I suspect we'll end up spending the rest of our time um, talking about. But, you know, the first one is going to be uh, racial equity vis a vis mobility and city planning. And for that one, I have a fun story. Um, it's fun in quotes, I suppose. Okay. I went to rural North Carolina um, in January, saw my grandmother for the first time in six years. And, um, you know, she was feeling, we had already quarantined and she was really excited to see me. Um, and so she made some decisions that I wasn't necessarily in favor of, but I can't tell my grandmother what to do. And so one of those things was that uh, we, were, we got in a car together and we drove around and I was like, oh my God, I cannot... I can't be here with you. So the windows are rolled down as much ventilation as possible because um, COVID is still real. But we were driving around the town and um, she was pointing out, you know, this is where poor black people live. This is where black people with a little, min little bit of money live. This is, where, uh, this is where the white people with no money live. This is where white people who consider themselves progressive and want to live near black people live. And the segregation and how stark the segregation was really um, caught me by a surprise because on an intellectual level, like I am very much aware that redlining is real, <laughs> that it has uh, separated communities. The community that I live in now that I ran for office in was formerly redlined and we um, you know, and as a member, as chair of the Neighborhood Association of a formerly redlined community, right, as a black person, I was like, well, how are we going to fix this mess you guys have put yourselves in? Um, but what, what always grips me is that the segregation is planned, right? Like we are yeah. separated because people wanted us to be separated. And... Now, um, now that I have a city planner in front of me, <laughs> now that oh, I've got right. an expert here, <laughs> I do Oops. wonder, I do wonder, um, at the very least, when you were uh, pursuing your higher education in the area, um, in what way did your like, professors and the material and what have you, like, address this issue of segregation? Was it something that the material was like, okay, oops, we messed up. Uh, we, we thought we were doing something, uh, that would, you know, be in our long-term interests, but that was wrong. And so now as city planners in our industry, we have to do something differently or how do they go about it? Um, I think it's very, basically your first semester, let's say future planners out there. First yeah. of all, become a planner, everyone <laughs> love, love that. Seriously, even if you don't get involved in your community, go to a meeting because it's ultimately it's your community. Let's yes. just remember that. Us planners are just trying to make what the community wants and needs a reality. So yeah. those of you out there, get involved. You don't need to go to grad school to be involved. But for those of you that do really want to be involved and do go to grad school, um, your first semester is basically going to be, here's how, well, at least at my school in Atlanta, sure. other people might be different. <laughs> here's how we fail. Huh. Yeah. I mean, it starts with like the introduction of zoning. You take a lot of history courses, uh, the history of planning. Um, how did city, like, uh, we spent 
weeks talking about redlining and related things. I do want to make sure, like, everyone that's aware, it's not like, oh, this was an informal thing. Yeah. It was a formal, like, written by the government. You could not receive a loan for this to buy property in this place if you are black, yes. if you are, or whatever the rules are, because they varied depending on where you were. But then, even after redlining was you know, a no-go anymore. That uh -huh. was like, the government can't be do that. Then housing, like, uh, covenants and stuff come in. Yeah. HOA rules. You would have particular neighborhoods, like, make you sign. If you purchase property here, you must agree to not sell it to a black couple. Yes. You must not sell it to an unmarried person. You must not sell it to a gay couple. You know, all these things. And you have to agree to these, and they will not let you sell. Yep. And so that's how we end up with these... Uh, hyper segregated communities because these people are being forced to live in very particular places that mm -hmm. uh, by all of these different artificial means well i guess art artificial in that we created right. them right um i mean and that's in that's just it's <sighs> the problem though as i was say if you're expecting to go mm. to school and hear the answers there's not any because we're still here yes so let's okay just make that that's good to know we're still here. <laughs> it's our job to work towards the answers. Basically, your grad school career, when it comes to dealing with that, is going to be learning how did we mess up so we don't keep doing that. Well, that's they good. do not tell you what to do. That's perfect. That's wonderful. We're still figuring out what to do, obviously. Um, but I and think... the ramifications are huge, as I say, as a result of that. I mean, like that's how you end up with so many things. I mean, the really, you know, uh, the way we've planned cities that we also then, you, when you uh, segregate these communities, that leads to disinvestment. All of a sudden, those communities don't have grocery stores. They don't have schools. They don't have this. They don't mm -hmm. have that. And then that limits upward mobility. And that's why you end up with, you know, terrible levels of poverty in a lot of these communities um, that they can't escape from very easily. And that's all yeah. our fault as planners. I think it's, um, well, it's, I, I, I don't want you to necessarily fall on the sword or what have you, because it's, it's a, everyone lives in this community, right? Everyone um, over a certain age saw these rules or what have you and, and thought they were a good idea at the time. Yeah. We weren't alive, right? But it's now our job basically to correct those errors. And I think it's really interesting, yeah. the perspective that you're bringing uh, because people are generally very proud of their cities and where they live and what have you. And so, you know, you, it's off screen, um, but I've got maps of Atlanta and Minneapolis here. And, you know, I've never looked at the map and thought, well, in what way is this, does this represent a failure, right? A failure of design, a failure of planning. And I think that's... Uh, a fascinating question that could probably feed a whole now, podcast in and of itself. Oh, for real. I was like, just so that you have some, and people of the internet, uh, yeah. I don't know a lot about Minneapolis. Sure. Um, I don't know too much. I did a little deep dive before talking to you in case that came up. So, you know, I could plug some things. That's okay. But um, Atlanta is like <laughs> one of the most obviously segregated cities I've ever encountered. You know, it's like north side, white. Yeah. South side, black. Yep. And literally down the I-20 line. Like, and it's crazy. It's crazy. Yep. And that's what made learning in that city, honestly, though, very also like reflective is uh, it's a city that's really actively forced to deal with uh, these issues in a way that other cities aren't mm -hmm. because it's so prominent. So. And, I, and I just want to, since I know you can hang with this conversation, um, when it comes to the politics of it, so for everyone who's listening, when he's talking about I-20, that's um, an interstate that kind of cuts uh, east to west across the city of Atlanta. And when he's saying um, that regulations said that you could not sell to a black person in a certain area, there was a time when the regulation likely said, if this is above the I-20 uh, interstate, inter interstate 20, you cannot sell to a black person there. If it is below I-20, then you can sell to a person of color, a black person there. And that's why we have the stark racial divisions. 
He's nodding. Yeah. The expert agrees with me. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm nodding. Sometimes I was like, I forget some of you people are not going to see my face. So oh, okay. I'm nodding for everyone else. <laughs> yes, that is what's happening. Uh, and it's just crazy. And that, well, and it plays into, as I say, a huge uh, uh, way into how we think about mobility, which yep. is, you know, where my little bubble is. You know, yeah. as I say, I mean, look at in Atlanta. Look at where, uh, for the most part, now granted, attitudes on MARTA, the transit agency in Atlanta, have shifted a little. But initially, sure. look at where the rail lines were built versus look at who's on the bus. Yeah. You know, white people ride trains if they take public transit. Mm -hmm. Other people take the bus. Um, and that's very, very reflective in a lot of cities as I... to how we built this. When I lived in Atlanta, I distinctly remember the concern about expanding bus transportation being that people from the city would go to the suburbs. Like, like straight up, their rationale is, no, we do not want people from the uh, the urban areas of Atlanta to come out to Cobb County. <laughs> you know what that means. <laughs> exactly. Uh-huh. For everyone exactly. listening who is wondering black people <laughs> that's what it means that is what it's it means. really what it means yeah um and it's a huge i mean that's a it's a constant struggle in uh any city you work in i've had the privilege of working on projects in seattle i've had privileges on working on projects mm. in san francisco um all of these you know i'm using air quotes like liberal meccas sure. it's still a problem there even from people that identify as you know oh i'm not well, the problem, I agree, the problem is everywhere. One thing I will say about these liberal Mecca cities in Minneapolis, I think is one as well, is that we are aware of the problem and trying to do stuff, something about it. Like um, on a citywide level in particular, often there are failures at those attempts. And so you don't really see the positive impacts of uh, a program that has been attempted and failed. Right. And you won't really see a positive impact until we find some way to resolve this quagmire now, that we're in. So that might be the case in Minneapolis. But I'll tell you, at least in San Francisco, mm. uh, or no, well, San Francisco and Seattle. Um, it's also a lot that they don't have to uh, due to the demographics of these cities. They do not have to actively deal with it because there are not enough people with loud enough voices. Oh, sure. I was like, you know, I was like, the African-American population in Seattle is, in terms of the total population, is nothing like Atlanta or Houston. Right. You know, so we're not having to actively deal with a lot, or we, when I was there, like, we weren't having to actively deal with those issues as much. Certainly. Um, even though you should. I was going to say the problem in those cities is then those people get forgotten. I... Whereas, <laughs> so that happens. I think it also illustrates the difficulty of solving the problem when the population that you're really trying to support is a smaller percentage and you're still not able to um, untangle that Gordian knot. Um, before we get, you know, this is bottomless coffee. We are positive and upbeat and I can feel... is almost out. Exactly. We will take a coffee break here because you talked about racial equity and you also talked about sustainability. And uh, I know I want to spend some time on that too. So we'll be right back. Okay. Okay, everybody, we are back. Uh, Ryan got a refill. I was, I was doing okay in case anyone was wondering. Um, and now we, so um, just to clue you in, on the break, we talked for like two seconds about uh, racial equity stuff to really like process our feelings there, some COVID stuff. But now with everything else done with, we are going to talk sustainability. And just a couple of episodes ago, um, just so you know, Ryan, uh, this hasn't even aired yet for you. We uh, kind of approached this topic of sustainability and we're like tiptoeing kind of around like the major dramatic life changes that you have to make if you really want to be like carbon neutral or okay. carbon negative or what have you. I'm so interested for it to come out because I want to hear. Oh, it's really fun. And I can already tell you, um, 
Rachel from episode two came back as a guest host for that episode. And so I really feel like we're building that community, again, calling back to that kind of intellectual abstract type of building community as opposed to uh, what you specialize in, which is roads, bridges, railroads, uh, transportation, bikes, and walking and the like. And building the fabric that the community inhabits. Yeah. And I'm kind of relating back to that story of you growing up on the farm and then having your life changed um, in France. Uh, I was hearing that because of those decisions made by whoever made those decisions in France, um, that small town is so much farther ahead than we are in terms of climate change uh, resilience and preparation and the really the whole nine, right? Um, I don't think a lot of people right now at this stage in the game appreciate that if this climate emergency continues to escalate, then uh, we will have to make even more major changes to the way that we live our lives. Um, certainly having four cars would probably be out of the question. It definitely should be out of the question. But, so. um, but then what would your family do, right? Because those infrastructure plans haven't been made. You're not able it to walk to the store. To live. Um, like we could function with one car um but it was just even then i was like the fact that you know you for example when i lived there having four people under one roof that were of ages where school and work and everything needs to be a thing to have to rely on one car which don't worry, so many people do yeah. live in environments like that especially in the north end of my county it really limits your ability to um thrive and succeed in human society much less uh, not even considering your carbon footprint or anything like that. Like, how are you supposed to function economically? You know, how are we yeah. supposed to get jobs? How are we supposed to get to school if we did not all have our own cars? We'd have to be coordinate everything and hope that it lines up. Well, uh, I really love those questions because those are mobility questions. And I'm wondering if, um, is it, it was it that your first couple of courses in school um for uh city planning where okay so this is this is how we messed up with racial equity and now this is how we messed up regarding the climate um <laughs> and our upcoming climate disaster and these are the changes that we have to make um what role do you see city planning playing when it comes to sustainability um i mean I think the way that our cities in particular, um, I'm, you know, state and federal government is going to be huge mm. help. Um, but like the way we plan our cities is going to be most of the solution. Okay. Most of it. It's not, a lot of it can be helped by personal choice, but it's our job as planners to make those choices easier. Okay. Um, like I can tell you all you want, uh, give up your car. That'd be great for the environment. But how are you supposed to do that? Unless sure. the city has a decent public transit network or sidewalks to get you to the bus stop. Sure. How are we supposed to tell people that they should do this? That's it's not going to happen. It's our job to figure out how we're going to give people the option to be sustainable. Because right now the built environment does not allow it for so many people. So... Um... You know, earlier I told you about my maps on the wall, and I'm kind of I'm kind of looking at them now, and I'm wondering if, in the same way that you might look at a map as a racial equity failure, you might also look at it and see um, climate-related failures or sustainability failures. And is it the role of a city planner to say to policymakers, you know, hey, you gotta you gotta change, <laughs> you you must put you know, more concentrated housing in this area if you're going to meet your carbon uh, reduction goals or what have you. Is that part of the conversation? Um, yes, often it is. Um, a lot of times it's not... A lot of times... Um, how do I want to exactly say this? A lot of times, like, a project will be decided, for example. I mean, here in Houston, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. We are about to go under a giant highway expansion program. Oh, you are? Okay. And it was just determined that the state came in and said, well, we need to fix traffic in Houston. That means we need to expand the highway. That means that we need to do all these different things. And the state came in and did this, and they just decided it. Now they've asked, and they've asked, you know, engineering firms to do reviews. Um, For example, then we reviewed it. Um, and we're like, oh, this is a really bad idea, guys. Um, oh, no. <laughs> hey, this is, hey, this is like climate denial, but also like the number of people that you're expecting the highway to now be able to carry equals the number of homes that you just destroyed. Um, oh, my gosh. So, yeah. Yeah, that's like it, it. So, yeah, it very much is our job. Now, granted, a lot of uh, it, it, you walk a fine line in my. So, for example, uh, just so everyone knows. Uh, I work for a private consulting firm, not for a government entity. And there is a big difference as to sort of like, so basically, that, basically, basically, <laughs> <laughs> basically, that means I'm hired by someone to come in and give them invite or not advice or to build something. Lots of times they'll tell you we need to build X. So if they, the, the city will come and say, we need to build a highway. Okay. Uh, then I'm like, oh, crap, I have to build a highway. <laughs> um, but usually... <laughs> That, at, for example, at our firm, we're very well respected, and so we can sort of be like, oh, well, maybe we should consider alternative ideas to this. But most firms don't do that. Okay. Um, mostly, it's like we do what we're paid to do. Sure. Um, but a, a lot of, I will say, a lot of people, at least a lot of mo- uh, new firms are getting into the idea of active mobility. And luckily, that's where I'm like, for everyone else, please go to your government and tell them so that they can tell us to build nice things, please. Gotcha. You know, it's like, and then elect elected officials that are on board with this. And so like, that's me in like my private life. I'm like, you know, rallying around representatives that can voice sustainability at the government level so that then they are pouring your tax dollars into building projects that purport, uh, support sustainability. Um, in our little bubble, that's the weird world. Like I said, it's, we really have, we don't have to, but we're supposed to build what we're paid to build. Now, granted, sure. I, you could just work for, if you're like me, work for a firm that doesn't do highways. That's what we do. We don't do that. Hmm. Um, we build bike lanes and help with transit and, you know, stuff like that's what we decided we want to do. And it's great. Yeah. Um, so, but that's sort of where it is. And it's an awkward position for a lot of professionals, I think. I, I mean, I think we've all been there. It's very relatable to have someone ask you for something and then you think, well, there's a, a much better way to do this. <laughs> and, uh, they are just dead set on doing it the way they want to do it because, you know, maybe it's it was in committee for six months through the state legislature or something. And now we've really, we're past like the ideation phase and we are in the implementation phase and we're not going to like start over <laughs> for whatever reason. And so I think it actually really is important that we bubble up and kind of mainstream uh, these ideas so there are far, far better ways to connect communities than the traditional ways that we know are really damaging to our environment and to the overall health of um, our communities. Not to mention that as soon as you said they were destroying homes to put down that highway, I said, mm-hmm. hold on, <laughs> hold on. That's the theme of interstate, y'all. Yep. That's the theme. It's like how many, like, interstates are just like, oof, yep. so many homes. If, if you guys are not familiar with the way that the interstate highway system was constructed, sometimes people would go out of, it almost seemed like it had to be intentional. Like, when, even oh, when yeah. there were alternate routes, they drove straight through impoverished communities, demolished them, and then built highways to facilitate mm-hmm. suburban expansion. Mm-hmm. Like, and who's that catering to? Based on what we said earlier, who could yes. get the loans to be there? You know, it's like it was just double whammy. Not only could these people not move to the suburbs, even if they wanted to, then their homes were demolished, and then in so many places, then they're making rules like, oh, you can't build apartments, you can't build yeah. this. So many people 
touching on that just for half a second. Okay, okay have like, here we go. <laughs> half a second, I just have to say it. I was like, so many people are like, well, why don't we just build more affordable housing? This is me in the housing, my little voyage into the housing world. Okay. And I'm like, well, it's because you made it illegal in almost yeah. every part of the world. Like a lot of people don't realize that most areas are zoned and it has to be a single family home and it has to be. So yes. that's where the affordable housing crisis comes in. You know, I was actually on a, uh, well, I was sitting in on a panel discussion on racism and housing and they really homed in on this idea of uh, zoned single family housing and how it sounds so nice when you're in Doesn't it. Doesn't it sound cute? <laughs> I think it sounds beautiful. You think cute little house, like right. picket fence, I got a tree, like yes. my dogs, there's dogs walking. But it is really prohibitive. It is no other type of anything is allowed here except for single family housing, even if it is better for the community to have something different. Well, as I say, and that plays into like how we can't sustainability. Exactly. Let's get into how is this not sustainable? Right. This is not sustainable for a number of reasons. Like one, I just told you, all of a sudden there's so much many fewer people in that space. So any utilities you build to them mm. are more expensive per foot or mm -hmm. mile or whatever unit you're using, whether it's pipes, power lines, because you're building it for fewer people and going just as far. Yep. Let's go a different route. Now everyone has to drive further or walk or whatever, whatever it is that we're trying to do because you're not allowing, when you're only allowing single family homes, you know what you're not allowing? Schools, grocery stores, restaurants. Yeah. Uh, any sort of like- Gro basic Grocery stores. Function. Yeah. <laughs> so like, all of a sudden, if you get these giant areas, all of a sudden there's not a grocery store for two miles. Yeah. Then I have to get a car. Yeah. And then you're making it so hard just like I mentioned, utilities are then expensive. Now, even if you wanted to ride the bus, it is so much more expensive for your city to run that bus out there, all the way out there for fewer people. Mm -hmm. So it just keeps, it's this self-fulfilling cycle of just unsustainability. Yeah. Of Now, granted, there are, but on the flip side, now we're like, how do we combat this? Because the alternative is people are like, well, I don't want to live in a skyscraper. No one's sure. saying you have to do that at the same time. There's so many, just if we just made all the yards a little smaller, <laughs> if we just made all the houses a little narrower, if you right. were okay with townhomes and if that's infinitely, instantly better. Well, and I know? think, you know, at the this point in the conversation we're at, you know, it's not make the yard smaller, do a heavy, it's if someone owns that single family home, and they want to do something different with their own property, then they should have the right to do so. And right now the law says that they cannot do what they want with their own property. And I think that might be um, a messaging that could get to some of those people. Yes, well that's one of the fun things about here in Houston. Fun fact, so I, you know, I think everyone knows that zoning exists. Yes. In Houston, zoning's not a thing. That's been the weirdest thing. Zoning is oh, really? not, does not exist. What keeps our development so weird is we have parking requirements. So you have to build <laughs> giant parking lots. And then once you build a parking lot, then all of a sudden the uses change of what's economical to build. Hmm. And so then you end up just market-based by requiring X amount of the space to be used for whatever. And that varies by use. Like if you're a commercial building, you have to, you know, so it varies. All of a sudden, it's not economical to build an apartment anymore. All of a sudden, it's not economical to build yeah. a multi-level shopping center because you have to do all of this like wait like this empty space for cars when you could be filling that with stores oh that's so funny that you brought up parking um so you know i mentioned before that i'm the uh I, i'm on the board currently of the neighborhood association and a mini city plan <laughs> the the thing that reliably gets people to come to meetings, to show up and talk about it is access to parking. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what you want. We always have a, we have a saying here, like if you want people to show up, announce that parking is going to be removed. It doesn't oh, actually yeah. have to be. Like just say <laughs> it and people will show up. 
<laughs> they do not want people parking in front of their homes. They do not want to be inconvenienced where they might have to walk from one side of the block to the other because people who are in like the two story building down the street or have you are parking along the street, they are not here for it. Um, so if you, to all of the listeners and watchers out there, <laughs> <laughs> believe us, believe us, parking is probably one of the major things that gets in the way of uh, us making the sustainable moves that we need to make. Which is why I was like, we just need to have fewer cars or Agreed. alternative it was like, and have alternatives to get around because cars take up so much space, not just parking, but on the road. Yeah. Uh, like I want to throw out just a few numbers so that the people at home are aware yeah. of sort of like, let's just talk about road use. I'm not talking about parking. Like the average uh, city street lane, the average city lane can move between 600 and 1600 people an hour. That is one lane okay. of city street. The same amount of space dedicated in a dedicated transit lane. Now this is theoretical, like assuming that the demand is all there can move between 4,000 and 8,000 people an hour wow. because we are putting, cause think about it. Think about how big a car is. Yeah. You know how many people are usually in that car? Yeah. One. <laughs> it's one, the average of America is 1.1. 1. 1. Like, so think about how much physical space you are having to use to move people. And so that's sort of what we need to be mm-hmm. thinking about when it comes to how we prioritize movement. I want to use an example from Minneapolis. Okay. Oh, I was like, uh, do you know about the Metro, uh, is it Metro Transit? Yeah. Metro Transit C-Line. I don't know if I do know it about is the a, C-Line. Well, the C-Line is brand new. It's only 2019. So if you're okay. not an avid bus rider, you might not, you know, you might not encounter it. Okay. Uh, I believe it's on like, oh, what street is she on? Like uh, I know the A-Line because I've taken the A-Line before. That's a bus. And so there must be a B-Line. And now there's a C-Line. Is it C-Line? It's Penn, Penn Avenue. Down by the Mall of America. Yeah. Yep. So, for example... On that street, um, buses accounted for less than 2% of all traffic, but carried 27% of the people moving on it. I believe that. I believe and that's that. crazy. And then when that increased further when they turned it from, I believe it was Route 19 into the C line, which included a lot of upgrades and investments to make the servant more reliable and better. I know ridership on Sundays in particular like increased by 40% and overall increased by 20% with these upgrades. So here you are, this is not, like, I'm not even saying, don't, not even adding a bus lane, not even adding anything. All of a sudden, yeah. we're moving so many more people on this street with this no changes. That's so funny. You know, I never even thought about it as the C line. It would just be like a number and then the letter C afterward, after it. So I, I think uh-huh. I took the C line. <laughs> Go check out the C. It's yeah. Doing great. Yeah. It was actually, it was really nice. It was, um, it got me to where I needed to go very quickly. I was going to say, it's a great, I was going to say, investments in making transit good and making it for everyone, then it's a convenient option. And then people are willing to try it, even if it's not all the time. Like, that's the one thing. If so many people get on the bus and it's a terrible experience, and then Mm -hmm. you don't want to do it again. Mm -hmm. Like, so the only people that you're catering to are people that have to, but if you're, we're going to meet these climate goals and we're going to cut down greenhouse gas emissions, we got to make it to where the bus is accessible to everyone, regardless of income or yeah. where you are um, and make it convenient and pleasant to be on and uh, useful for everyone. So I agree. And um, we're going to co- go to the quickest coffee break. But I think it's so interesting that you say that this is what we have to do because it's so bizarre to me that that's not what we were doing in the first place. <laughs> I mean, we know why. Because who did I say the bus was for? That's fair. That's fair. Okay, fastest coffee break ever. Be right back. Okay, we are back. I think that actually was the fastest coffee break in bottomless coffee history. I had a single sip. <laughs> um, uh, and so just kind of following up on the question that I asked just before the coffee break, I really see um, the way that things have been planned and are being planned as a a desire to balance like convenience, equity, and now sustainability. And um, I think maybe 
we over indexed on that convenience part, like convenient for some, uh, incredibly convenient for some um, in our planning. And now that, you know, we've got the bottomless coffee community here, we're really wanting to change some things. Um, and we like to focus on solutions. So what are things that we can do just as normal humans, you know, to help balance those scales a little bit? Oh, okay. I mean, I think there's a lot of like easy gateways into okay. being sustainable with your mobility choices. It's like a positive gateway. Okay. Yes. A good thing. <laughs> We're not, you know, this will not ruin your life. Um, one thing I think about the trip you make and how far they are. Um, if you can, and if you are privileged enough to live in somewhere where you do not feel like you might die on the streets, hmm. consider walking or taking a bike. Um, if it's under two miles, although that's been when I was in Atlanta, mm -hmm. now that sounds scary biking in Atlanta and some of the places, but some of the, I was, there were a few streets and a few trips I could make where it was actually very convenient to take my bike. Huh. If you have one, I was gonna say, that's one thing. Think, can I do this? It, of course, if you are lots of people, uh, it's just not safe. I think about my boyfriend's commute to work. Perfect distance for biking, but it is not bikeable at all. Oh, not okay. Um, so, like, don't go out of your way. Um, another thing, um, I mean, most people live uh, in the United States, do live in an urban or urban e environment. So I'm sure a lot of you listeners out there have a bus that goes by somewhere in your vicinity. Take a look at it. You know, if it's a bus that comes every 30 minutes or more, Take a look at it on uh, there's so many apps that are so great mm. for like looking at bus routes these days. I love the transit app plug to them. Um, shout out to them. They're really great uh, at showing you when you can hop on the bus and look along the route. Yeah. You'd be surprised lots of times with your one local bus route where it can take you. And so that's what me and my boyfriend have been doing on Saturdays oh. is we've been going on in the transit world, I'm a little side note, we do this thing called transit oriented development, which we just okay. call TOD for short, which is building, you know, lots of stuff near transit so that it's accessible. But we go on our own TODs, which are transit oriented dates. Cute. So cute. <laughs> um, and we've been doing that and like exploring different, you know, whether over the weekend, whether it's coffee shops or restaurants along that bus route. Now here yeah. I am like, you know, I'm tra transit savvy. I don't own a car in Houston, Texas. Like, so I'm out here taking the bus everywhere, but my boyfriend, like, you know, had never been on a bus until he met me. Oh, interesting. And now he'll text me saying, like, I took the bus to get coffee. I went to do this. And all of a sudden you realize that some trips you don't need your car for. Got like, it. just look at, like, and that's just, it starts with just taking it to get coffee. There's no time limit, so you're not pressured. Don't, don't ever, I, I don't recommend anyone try their first transit trip if you have to be somewhere. Because oh, you'll sure. be new, you have to figure out how to pay, you have to figure out how to do this. But yeah. when you're when you got a moment and you're a sustainable person, you know, and you're like, oh, I want to do things. Um, mm -hmm. Just look, where can I get on my closest bus route? I um, I love that. I I do uh, I do believe that the way we get to places is like our own personal system. We have a system of getting there, and if you want to change uh, your system, just do it a little bit at a time. Yeah. Another like another great thing, like if let's say you're going on a longer trip, you live in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, take the train to Chicago once instead of driving or flying yeah. it's half the greenhouse gas emission it takes a little longer not gonna lie but advocate for better transportation <laughs> and it will get better it will right now it's a little slow that's true but you know like but that's like that, that convenience that's this that's the convenience i was talking about and when you balance the convenience of taking a plane balance. versus the sustainability uh you know, it changes the numbers a little bit. I was like, I mean, and then non-transportation related, cut out beef. <laughs> that's, that's my thing. That's what I did. <laughs> oh, you did? I didn't you know you did have that. A whole episode about, you could have a whole episode about that and like food and sustainability. You okay. should do that. If you have anyone, do that in the future. <laughs> well, on that <laughs> wonderful <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Riot. No, real quick, what can we do uh, to support you? Can we follow something? Can we? 
I was like, I mean, if you like trains and buses and you want to see videos of that, you know, you can follow me on Instagram at, at Tech Transport. Um, okay. That's probably the the best place. But I like really make my job easier. Show up to planning meetings in your local community. Like there are too many people that are out here with very loud voices mm. with a lot of money that prevent progress from happening. So if you want, if you, if you live in a place where the bus isn't convenient for you to go to a coffee, show up to a meeting one day so that maybe you will be, yeah. you know, because you'd be so surprised. People don't think their voice matters. And then, but literally it's like, this isn't, you don't even have to vote. And now everything's on zoom because of COVID just log <laughs> in, just log in, say, that's what you want to do. And that will make active mobility and transport planner just so much better because we'll be able to do great things for you guys. Go to, go to meetings, people. Um, thank you so much. This was really fantastic. Uh, and I will scheme and try to find a way to get you to come back because that was some good info you shared with us today. I appreciate okay. it, Ryan. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you for joining in the conversation today. I do realize that I've started saying that every coffee break is the fastest coffee break, but they really are quick lately. If you would like exclusive access to live streams of these conversations and to a community of people to converse with on topics like the one that we discussed here today, then please join our Patreon community at patreon.com slash bottomless coffee. Bottomless coffee podcast is produced by me, Jerome Evans, on social media everywhere as at Jerome T. Evans. Our Patreon producers are listed in the episode description. You can connect with the podcast on Instagram at at Bottomless Coffee Podcast. Our music is by Noir et Blanc V and God Mode. Thanks all. <laughs>